cursory look at Canada's key economic indicators to see that we are in a growth crisis. Just two weeks ago, the senior deputy governor of the Bank of Canada called Canada's lagging productivity an emergency. CME is pleased to participate in your study and share our thoughts on part of what is contributing to our economic malaise, Canada's regulatory competitiveness. Canada is an increasingly challenging jurisdiction to start, invest in, and grow a manufacturing business. Canadian manufacturers are caught up in an increasingly complex web of rules and requirements that prevent businesses and their employees from reaching their full potential. When we survey our members, a large majority of whom are small and medium-sized manufacturers, regula regulatory burden consistently pulls as one of the biggest barriers to growing their business. Over the last two decades, the federal government has undertaken a range of regulatory red tape reduction initiatives and reforms. They have all been useful to varying degrees, but fall well short of what is required to reduce the ongoing accumulation of red tape, removing the dynamism from our economy. This assessment applies to the current federal regulatory modernization agenda uh, underway by Treasury Board. While it has some worthwhile tools, it is too modest in its scope and its ambition. With that in mind, I'd like to share some of CME's recommendations on how the government should make Canada more competitive. First, we recommend that the government legislate economic growth and competitiveness mandates for all regulators alongside their current mandates. Presently, many regulators do not sufficiently consider the economic consequences of their actions because they are not required to. We can achieve both protection and prosperity, but only if the government sets an expectation that economic growth is an outcome that all regulators should be working towards. In the 2018 Fall Economic Statement, the government announced that it was considering implementing a change to add regulatory efficiency and economic growth to regulator mandates. However, after two rounds of consultations in 2019, it was quietly abandoned. This change could be modeled after the UK Growth Duty, implemented there in 2017, which provides detailed guidance for UK regulators on how they can better su support sustainable economic growth through the decisions that they make and the ways in which they regulate. We believe this is the most important policy change that this committee could recommend and that the government could undertake. There are other steps the government should take to reduce the cumulative burden facing manufacturers and all businesses. We believe the government should expand the scope and ambition of the one-for-one one rule. As, these, as committee members here will know, this rule requires that every new regulation that increases the administrative burden on business, that the cost of this burden must be offset through other regulatory challenges. Despite this rule being in place for well over a decade or over a decade, the number of overall administrative requirements on business has continued to increase from 129,000 when the federal government first started tracking this figure in 2014 to 149,000 as of mid-2022. That's a net increase of nearly 20,000 new administrative requirements over eight years. We also think there's an important leadership role for the federal government to work with the provinces to undertake a serious effort to reduce interprovincial trade barriers and promote regulatory harmonization between provinces through mutual recognition. Most of Canada's interprovincial trade barriers are the costs of complying with rules, regulations, standards, and certifications that vary from one province to another. Mutual recognition would provide that anyone, for any one province should allow any product, service, credential, uh, or other certification to be considered automatically compliant if it is already compliant in another jurisdiction. The 2017 Canada Free Trade Agreement did create a body, the Regulatory Reconciliation and Cooperation Table, to resolve interprovincial regulatory differences. However, it has proven to be not fit for purpose. While it has done some valuable work, it is, simply does far too little far too slowly. Lastly, and while perhaps not as transformative, we do believe there are small but meaningful steps that the government can take to strengthen some of the regulatory modernization tools already at their disposal. For instance, the External Advisory Committee on Regulatory Competitiveness, first established in 2018, provides advice to the President of the Treasury Board on how to improve Canada's regulatory competitiveness. It has made a series of excellent recommendations to the government, including in its most recent letter, which stated, and I quote, what we have heard from all is that there is an urgent need to address the challenges that face the regulatory system. We recommend that Treasury Board adopt a comply or explain principle to the committee's advice, which means that the government is obliged to either pursue the proposed initiatives from the committee or explain why they will not be pursued. This comply or explain principle would add a level of accountability to the work and other government consultation panels. To wrap up, um, the ability to navigate complex regulatory processes should not be a primary driver of business success in Canada. However, it has become so, and in the face of the current growth crisis, essential that governments invest more of their time and energy to help make Canada a lower friction economy.
doing so will help create a more efficient and competitive industrial economy while increasing the wealth and well-being of Canadians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greer. Ms. Pullman, welcome back. Please go ahead for five. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. As you may know, the CFIB is a not-for-profit organization representing the interests of over 97,000 small and medium-sized businesses across Canada. Our members come from all sectors of the economy in all regions of Canada. It's important to distinguish between regulations that are justified and excessive regulations, which we know as red tape. Um, many regulations are integral and needed in our system, such as those that protect the health and safety of Canadians. On the other hand, red tape is excessive government regulations that are unfair, overly costly, poorly designed or contradictory. It can also include unnecessary delays and poor government customer service. It undermines productivity, lowers wages and harms the entrepreneurial spirit. CFA first estimated uh, the cost of regulation to Canadian businesses in 2005. Our most recent measure from 2020 found that the total cost of regulation on businesses from all levels of government was $38.8 billion. Of this, businesses identified 28% or $10.8 billion of that as excessive regulatory burden. More importantly, the regulatory burden hits small businesses the hardest. The cost of government regulation for businesses with fewer than five employees were five times higher than the cost for businesses with 100 or more employees. This is because larger businesses can spread the regulatory burden across a greater number of employees and often have in-house resources devoted to compliance. Beyond the burden of time and money, excessive regulations creates frustration. It might take two hours to understand confusing language on a form and get an answer from a government helpline, and then another two hours for your blood pressure to come down. So it's no surprise that 87% of small business owners say excessive regulations add significant stress to their lives, and 63% would not advise their children to start a business given the current burden of regulations in Canada. Further, 81% agree that excessive government regulations reduces their business's productivity and ability to grow. If regulatory costs on their businesses were reduced, small businesses would use that extra time and money to increase wages, invest in new equipment, and dedicate more time to employee training, of all of which are key to growing productivity. We have identified a number of specific examples of excessive regulations at the federal level that need attention, including things like the disability tax credit forms, T4 dental care and UHT reporting, CBSA classifications, airline fitness to travel forms, interprovincial trade barriers like the movement of food across borders and many more. And I'm happy to elaborate on any of those if needed. Now we can try and fix every specific regulatory issue that arises, but this will never fix the overall regulatory burden. So a broader approach is also needed. Over the years, we have learned that there are three essential ingredients to effective regulatory modernization. There are one, political leadership. Effective and sustained regulatory reform must be driven from the top, with a political commitment from the leadership that is echoed through all the departments and agencies. Second, regulatory accountability. Regulation deserves the same level of transparency and debate as taxing and spending. Real regulatory accountability requires ongoing measurement and external oversight. To do this, governments need to look at the regulatory burden found not only in regulations, but also in legislation, policies, and forms. Additionally, governments should measure that burden from all government departments, agencies, and delegated authorities to obtain a comprehensive measure and then publicly report on that measure on a regular basis. The third is constraints on regulators. Perhaps the most effective element to achieving regulatory modernization is imposing constraints on the regulators themselves. Implementing a cap on regulatory costs can ensure that the burden of regulations is kept in check. And um, it's also approached, it also forces uh, regulators to concert, consider alternatives and trade-offs and to prioritize those regulations that are most important. A regulatory cap could take the form of a reduction target or a target for no net increase in regulatory activity. Now, the current federal one-for-one -one rule, where one regulation of equal burden must be eliminated for every new one introduced, is a good example of this. However, the federal approach is too narrow and too complicated. We would also suggest government continue to work on a few other regulatory modernization best practices. They include things like make plain language a priority. It's reasonable to expect governments to provide consistent, timely advice in plain language. Introduce a virtual suggestion box, which would allow citizens to flag red tape examples for government. Next, keep compliance flexible and provide basic guidelines for what constitutes compliance. Regulations really work best when they are outcome-based rather than prescriptive. This allows businesses to find the most cost-effective way to comply with the rules. However, smaller businesses do not typically have the resources to explore different options for the least costly way to comply. So those businesses having basic guidelines regarding what constitutes compliance is extremely important. Fourth, improve online options. Being able to do things online can save a lot of time, but it's also important that online options provide clear pathways to deal with a live person when needed. And finally, 
improve the accountability of regulators by instituting measures like reverse onus guidelines. Often there is little or no flexibility for business owners when it comes to meeting their compliance obligations. However, regulators usually have no specific timelines imposed on them for when decisions will be made or paperwork will be approved. These imbalances should be remedied so regulators also have deadlines and suffer consequences when deadlines are not met or if advice proves inaccurate or inconsistent. Thanks for the opportunity and I'd like to share our thoughts and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Swans, am I pronouncing that right? You got it right. Thank you. Uh, iCanada serves businesses who depend on the movement of goods across Canada's international borders. We have over 85 years of experience bringing industry and government together for collabor collaborative decision making. I'm joined by Keith Musser, the VP of Regulatory Affairs at IE Canada and a member of Treasury Board's External Advisory Council on Regulatory Competitiveness. A decade ago, I was starting a new role the VP came out of his office and said something along the lines of, per my note, let's go decide on our annual goals. The whole team went into the boardroom. He dismissed the first person. And after the second person spoke, the visibly uncomfortable VP stood up, announced the annual targets, and abruptly ended the meeting. The conclusion was decided before the beginning. Here's the deal. His team had loftier goals than the plan to and planned to accomplish them. He could have looked like a hero, but he simply refused to listen. Many consultations executed by the Government of Canada have the same outcome. The structure of the consultation is perfectly manipulated to ensure the feedback it receives is exactly what it wants to hear. In social media, we call this an echo chamber. We only follow accounts that reconfirm our biases each and every day. We will never get to a modernized regulatory environment without engaging the, regulatory, the regulated party. On the American television drama The West Wing, C.J. Craig, the press secretary, often laments about Take Out the Trash Friday, where unfavorable stories are dumped. She fears that the administration has become too skilled. We notice that there is a substantial spike in formal consultations around December, July, and August, perhaps a similar phenomenon. How does an ineffective regulation enter into force? It was dumped in the summer, presented to like-minded special interest groups for their echo of approval, and presented to industry as their newest piece of red tape to wrap up in. I Canada believes it's time to take a new approach. In 2019, I had the privilege of working with IE Canada on a proposal that would not only eliminate ineffective regulations, but propose a structure to ensure no new unnecessary regulations were implemented. The proposal is included in our written submission today. Our proposal is modeled after the USA's Border Interagency Executive Council, which was initiated under President Obama and continued under President Trump. Our proposed Canadian Interagency Border Council would be responsible for vetting all existing and proposed regulations that could impact Canada's border. The best part of this proposal is that the regulators would be forced to sit down and have meaningful conversations with the regulated stakeholders. Industry representatives must have a substantive role and voice at the Border Council table with a structure that ensures the regulators can regulate. Impacted government departments would be forced to justify in writing why they choose to diverge from industry recommendations. The Border Council will radically improve Canada's competitiveness while reducing the regulatory cycle and budgetary outlays. Just like the employees of the uncomfortable VP, Industry stakeholders not only have aligned goals with the government at the border, they also have the tools and the data to make them a reality. Through the Collaborative Border Council, Canada could improve our global competitiveness in an ever-shifting geopolitical world. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Greco, please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, honorable members, it is a pleasure to appear before you on behalf of 400 Chambers of Commerce and Boards of Trade and more than 200 businesses of all sizes from all sectors of the economy and from every part of the country. It will come as no surprise that regulatory burden continues to be a growing concern for Canadian business. The World Bank's Ease of Doing Business report rate Canada as 23rd in 2020, but we were fourth in the world as recently as 2006. A big part of this decline is we are now ranked 53rd for the burden of government regulation on business. Regulation is literally 
stifling our economy. It goes without saying that the right policy environment can help businesses succeed and generate long-term economic growth for the country. Making Canada an an attractive destination for business investment that supports economic growth requires getting the fundamentals right. At a time when inflation is persistent, government and the private sector must look at new ways to make Canada more competitive. Governments in the past have attempted to regulate our industries into a more competitive frame, but this has had the opposite effect as the costs of starting and growing a business have become a disincentive to investment. The regulatory burden is troublesome in several ways, but two stand out. First, we can't continue to move at a snail's pace. We need the government to be more ambitious. We need the government to accelerate modernization and ensure approvals and permitting can meet our public policy ambition. Second, the ongoing ability of companies to comply with complex regulations is increasing operating costs. It is consistently one of the biggest barriers to economic growth. According to the SME Regulatory Compliance Cost Report, the total regulatory compliance cost to small businesses was nearly $5 billion in 2011, which at the time was approximately $3,500 per business. That number has no doubt increased over the past decade, along with the regulatory burden overall. We cannot afford more private sector investment decisions to be sidelined because of the complex regulatory environment in Canada. Too often, we hear from our members about the investments they have on hold while they wait for direction from the government. Lack of clarity and speed on the new investment tax credits is a good example. While other jurisdictions such as the United States move quickly to create the conditions for investment, Canada is falling behind. Complying with the complex network of overlapping regulations with all levels of government is expensive and time consuming. When combined with inefficient and unpredictable regulatory processes, this sets all businesses up for failure. While I commend the government for pushing a regulatory modernization agenda, we must move more boldly and urgently. In the time remaining, I would like to focus on three recommendations. First, the government must move to implement an economic and competitiveness mandate to federal regulators. Too often, regulators do not fully consider economic impacts on business when making decisions. Second, is regulatory alignment across domestic and international jurisdictions. When regulations are more consistent between jurisdictions, businesses are better able to trade within Canada and beyond. Quite simply, we should not require a free trade agreement within our own country. Unless the government actively works to improve collaboration and alignment to ensure businesses businesses are not at a disadvantage, we will see less innovation, fewer choices, and higher prices. An example of this is when each province establishes its own framework for regulating pesticides or rules for the trucking of goods across jurisdictions. Finally, the government should pledge to provide regulatory certainty for businesses. Evidence-based regulations can protect the public interest and promote market success. And for companies looking to invest billions of dollars in developing new pipelines, new mines, and other large-scale infrastructure projects, this is a must-have. In closing, Canada needs smarter regulatory systems, better processes, and well-designed regulations to help minimize the cost of business and unlock economic growth while improving public health and safety outcomes. Sustained collaboration with all levels of government and our international partners will make it easier for businesses to do what they do best, produce. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We'll start our six-minute rounds with Mrs. Cousy, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much uh, to all of our witnesses for being here today. I see uh, a lot of friends uh, on the witness stand here today, and so it's a pleasure to have all of you with me. I'm looking at a March 22nd, 2023 article, which indicates that small business had paid at that time a total of $22 billion, that's not an M, that's a B, in federal carbon tax. Now I'm looking at a February 20th, 24 article, which indicates that the federal government scaled back their carbon tax rebates for small business. And in fact, that the federal government owed uh, small businesses $2.5 billion in promised carbon tax revenues, which as of this date and this article have not been returned to small business. Now, I recognize, Ms. Pullman, your organization estimates that small businesses contribute as much as 40% of the government's overall uh, carbon price revenue, even though even though data from your organization indicates that 
52% of small firms oppose carbon pricing, and that as a result of this carbon pricing, they're being forced to raise prices for consumers, and over 4 in 10, 45%, said it will increase pressure on them to freeze, cut salaries and wages, something that supposedly uh, parties in this room would like to see uh, maintained or improved, and over 4, excuse me, 40% say that we'll have to reduce investment um, in their businesses. Now, we know that this government likes to perpetuate the lie that uh, the carbon tax is, is even carbon neutral, never mind that families are losing funds as a result of this carbon tax, as was evidenced by the testimony of the parliamentary budget officer who gave testimony to this committee to that effect. So, Ms. Pullman, would you agree that, that this is not true as well for small businesses in Canada, that they are, in fact, losing money on the, on, with the carbon tax, and that, in fact, they are owed money by this federal government, and, and that these, these cuts to the carbon tax should, should not be implemented because of the $22 billion that's already been collected, the $2.5 billion that was promised back to them, which is yet to be received. Can you comment on that, please, Ms. Pullman? Uh, yes, certainly. I think we've been very vocal about the fact that the $2.5 billion that's been sitting with government since 2019 is owed back to small businesses, and it is only a fraction. That, that's based on about 8 or 9% of the total revenues coming in. Uh, and as you stated, our calculations uh, are it's closer to 40% uh, of the revenues that come from small businesses that uh, make up carbon revenues in the provinces in which it exists. Um, and we believe that uh, they're, they've just lowered the amount that they are going to provide to small businesses from 9 to 5% and giving and sort of giving it to other groups for a variety of reasons. Um, so, yeah, it's become um, a real drag for many small business owners right now who are feeling the pinch and not feeling... Uh, that they're uh, necessarily being considered when it comes to the carbon tax, though they pay a lot of it. So we're hoping to see um, some movement on that shortly. Indeed. I think a real drag is an understatement. I, I'm very proud to come from a small business family, uh, and I know the stress around the dinner table if the store has had a bad day, and I can't imagine the stress of the carbon tax and all these millions of Canadians. We know this government has not been a friend to small business. For example, the 2017 uh, tax changes they made an attempt to implement. This is just another example of that. Mr. Rico, you said in your opening statement that according to the SME Regulatory Impli Compliance Cost Report, the total regulatory compliance cost to small Small businesses was nearly five billion in 2001, uh, 2011. Excuse me, which at the time was approximately 3,500 per business. Would you have any idea uh, how much of this would have been carbon tax related? I don't have any idea, uh, Ms. Cousy, but I, what I can say about those compliance costs is that that's because there's different requirements and different processes. In, um, in different jurisdictions and the fact that a lot of our uh, members who are SMEs that they have to that takes them over a year or two just to be able to get a permit um, that creates a hindrance to be able to do business and so from our perspective like that ties into the fact that we're not getting things built done in Canada and if we're not getting things built done in Canada then we're not spearing economic growth and from our standpoint I think that requires what I tied into my earlier remarks is that we need it. We need ambition in order to drive economic growth. Ambition without action, from our perspective, leads to empty economic promises, and we won't reverse our investment trends. So if you look at, we're the second worst in the OECD in terms of business investment. We're almost near the bottom in terms of research and development spending. That all adds into the fact that um, if we don't have a proper level playing field for businesses to succeed, we won't be able to reduce the cost of doing business and supporting innovation. Mr. Greer, do you have any comments to add uh, on behalf of manufacturers and exporters relative to the effect of the carbon tax on, on the people you represent, please? Um, I would just add that, that manufacturers are generally facing a very high uh, cost, high pressure environment at the moment, uh, and it's cumulative, so it is certainly tax, uh, as we're discussing here today, regulatory burden and all of the costs uh, identified and, and maybe not captured in, in federal processes. Uh, there's certainly um, the issue of, of incentives for manufacturing investment and the pressures coming from the U.S. through the Inflation Reduction Act, not to mention that inflation also impacts all of the inputs that, that manufacturers uh, require to produce products. So uh, it's a very challenging environment for, for manufacturers, and it's, it's really all of those factors that are driving anxiety uh, among among the industrial sector. Uh, Mr. Swantz, anything to, to add uh, in, as my time comes to a close in 15 seconds? <laughs> Thank you. I think the piece on the carbon tax is in to, to ensure that Canadian companies have a competitive footing in, in a world, right, in a global economy. Um, not all jurisdictions have such a tax. 
how how are Canadians being equally treated in a global economy? And, and that, that's really one of the big pieces around regulations that impact trade. How do we justify an internal regulation that makes us uncompetitive on the global stage? Indeed. Telling testimony from families and small businesses, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. Mr. Kuzmerchuk, please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank you all for being here uh, today. And uh, you know, you just heard from one of the apostles of the do-nothing conservatives on, on climate change, but I wanted to provide you with a different perspective. I wanted to say thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank you, Mr. Uh, Greer, especially for, for being here today representing the Canadian manufacturers and producers. Uh, my hometown in Windsor, there's a saying, if you want it built right, you built it in Windsor. We have a lot of manufacturers in our community. It's a huge part of our uh, prosperity in our community, our economy. So I wanted to say thank you for your uh, tremendous advocacy. You mentioned the um, uh, you mentioned the investment tax credits, and I read the Manufacturing uh, Canada's Futures report, and it highlighted the import importance of the investment tax credits for helping manufacturers to transition to a zero emission uh, clean economy. How important are the uh, investment tax credits that are contained in our federal government's Bill C-59? Um, well, thank you for the question. So, um, you know, we, um, you know, very quickly after uh, the Inflation Reduction Act was unveiled in the U.S., uh, began advocating strongly for uh, Canada to take appropriate action so that uh, investment in building um, the clean um, net zero economy doesn't all happen south of the border. Uh, and the evidence of the impacts uh, of the IRA are starting to show themselves. I think factory uh, construction starts are up 70-some percent year over year in the United States. So, so they are attracting a lot of investment. Um, we were pleased to see the, the uh, investment tax credit decisions that were announced through Budget 2023. Um, and um, really now we're focusing um, and, and hoping the government focuses its efforts on accelerating the implementation of them. We have some timelines attached to them, but there's still a lot of guidance and implementation information that... Uh, manufacturers don't have, which um, uh, which slows or in some cases delays investment decisions. So um, well, we're pleased to see uh, the the ITCs that have been uh, um, that have been proposed so far. We're we're now waiting for uh, final guidance and implementation so that investment decisions can can start being made. And, and Mr. Gear, I I hear you loud and clear. The ITCs are vital to manufacturing, to jobs and and manufacturers. The Conservatives are holding up. Bill C-59 at committee, delaying, obstructing, holding up this uh, vital piece of legislation that contains the ITCs. Can you tell us what that delay and conservative obstruction is costing and risking Canadian manufacturers? So we've been long and will continue to urge uh, swift implementation of all ITC-related measures, um, both legislative and in, in the guidance side. So um, the government just finished some consultations on a lot of the guidance for some of the ITCs, um, and we and and that rests with um, with ISED and, and other relevant departments in finance. Um, so yes, we 100% encourage uh, swift adoption of all legislative measures to implement the ITCs, uh, but equally we're also um, um, very concerned that that the guidance and uh, information implementation information uh, that's needed so that investments can start being made uh, have not been uh, have not have not been made public yet. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Dreer. Uh, Ms. Pullman, uh, I want to reassure you that our government remains absolutely committed uh, to the carbon rebate program for small businesses that will return over billions of dollars to small businesses. So, so I wanted to reassure you and, and the members, we are absolutely committed to supporting small businesses and returning uh, that funding uh, to, uh, to small businesses. Um, the, uh, the, the Library of Parliament provided a table, a report, that listed the uh, one for one rule implementation over the last 11 years, both under the conservative uh, government, under the liberal government. The top four years for reducing regulations, the top four years in the last 11 years happened under this liberal government. Um, we know that there's more work to be done. I wanted to ask you if there's one set of regulations or one sector uh, that you would focus on, what would it be? And this is a question not just for you, Ms. Pullman, but also for all folks around the table as well, too. Is there, is there a particular regulation uh, or a particular sector that you would focus on? Well, you know, it's, it's a tough question to answer because, frankly, if you start to pick 
who gets targeted. And I, I know there's been some of that work done already, and it's been interesting work. For example, transportation or whatever has been targeted to uh, go through some regulatory modernization initiatives. The problem is that it hits every business. And there needs to be, I think that's a good idea to sort of focus on those areas that are very specifically, but you also have to focus on the big picture. And I think sometimes the big picture it's depending on this sort of one act from 2015 that um, hasn't really moved or changed much. And I think it's a bit narrow and it needs to be broadened out. So for example, the, the one for one rule that currently exists and I think is still implemented and still being used, um, really just focuses on regulations. Yet increasingly rules that affect businesses and citizens come in legislation, policies and guidelines. And that's not included. So we don't know, frankly, how many rules are actually out there. Anything that requires a business or an individual to do something needs to be incorporated and thought about as part of the overall picture of how do we get a handle on what those rules are in, in, in Canada. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, Mr. Greer, Mr. Swans, would you like to jump in on, is there a particular uh, regulation that you hear from your um, members all the time. It just comes up all the time. Is there an example that you can share with us? Because that would help us understand better some of the uh, regulations and the impact. So I want to go from the 30,000, uh, uh, you know, uh, altitude level to the to sort of the grassroots. Yeah. Just curious. Very, we'll very we'll have time just for one of you to respond, please. Sure. Very quickly. Um, one, I just want to quickly echo Corinne in that um, while it is important to focus on the specific, um, it's akin to managing the symptoms of an underlying problem without treating the underlying problem. Um, if you're looking for the most recent and current example, uh, S211, the Child and Forced Labor uh, Private Members Legislation, um, while I think all of the organizations represented on this panel strongly support the objectives of that, uh, that bill, uh, there was zero consultation on the guidance that was issued from public safety just before Christmas. Uh, it imposes significant uh, burden uh, and compliance requirements on, on medium, uh, large, and some small um, manufacturers and, and many other members in other sectors that's created a lot of cost, anxiety, and expense um, at this moment right now in the lead up to the first reports that are due to be filed on this uh, at the end of May. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Vignola, thank you for the red tape free donuts you brought for the committee. You have six minutes, please. Ma'am. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, lady, thank you so much for being here today. I'll give you the time to put your earpieces on. Regula the regulatory framework and its burden is a subject that is particularly heavy for small businesses. For large businesses, we hear, oh, well, uh, okay, it's okay, we've already paid for that, and so we can get through this. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Greer. Uh, have, uh, do you feel the same way as major businesses seem to do? Uh, they can get on with business uh, as it is. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, <clears throat> I think the premise of your question is correct in that small and medium-sized businesses, certainly small and medium-sized manufacturers, are the ones that are hit hardest. Um, by regulation, especially regulation that is poorly designed or, or not put with a, uh, an SME in mind. Um, uh, but it's not just the individual regulations. It's that nobody seems to be thinking about the cumulative burden facing that particular business. Nobody, you know, when, when uh, um, a, a cost-benefit analysis comes in and says, well, we think the cost will only be this many thousand dollars and this many extra hours a month of time to comply, um, that's not taking into account the thousands of other dollars of cost and dozens of other hours that are being spent often by one or two employees to focus on that. So uh, without a doubt, we agree that the impact is, is largest on, on small and medium-sized businesses and is uh, a big proportion of what's driving some of the productivity challenges and, and, and helping those businesses grow from small to medium or medium to large. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for being so specific. Mr. Greer, you said that you hope that that regulations would be more uniform from one province to another, and that would facilitate businesses doing business in various locations. I'm not in disagreement, but I'm not in total agreement either, because there is the issue of, of the uh, jurisdictions that enters into the picture. When you go from province to province, you can't uh, cherry pick either. 
jurisdictions may vary. Nobody would say even in a free trade agreement agreement uh, that has its own uh, regulations uh, that uh, they would all be respected. Um, how would you uh, succeed in finding an environment where uh, you could respect uh, the jurisdictions of, a comp uh, of various provinces and yet there could be a trade between those provinces? Well, th thank you for the question. Um, so on the topic of mutual recognition, uh, absolutely we believe that there is an opportunity and there is no reason in many or most cases that there should be different rules, compliance, regulations, and certifications for every province and territory, um, especially um, a lot of these are small, um, uh, minor issues. So some of the more famous examples are different first aid kit regulations. What should be in a first aid kit in a workplace? Uh, fall protection. What, what type of protection should workers who are um, uh, in, at elevations have to be required to wear? There's nothing different from falling down a ladder in Alberta as there is in Quebec or on the East Coast. There are lots of areas where they're just very small, very minor um, technical differences um, that, that cause a lot of irritation for businesses. Um, you know, if we if if there was political will, and really it would take leadership from all the premiers, this is provincial jurisdiction, save for some federal regulations. Uh, it would really require an approach that one, there be buy-in, and that 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 premiers and senior ministers would want to pursue this. Uh, but two, there would of course have to be carve-outs for uh, provincial specific circumstances. So. There are certainly differences for doing certain things in Alberta, in the mountains that don't exist uh, in other provinces where you may have to adjust safety or regulatory requirement standards. Certainly there would be language requirements and other, uh, other issues for, for a province like Quebec. But uh, for the most part, most of these um, uh, aren't needed and cause um, significant cost uh, and, and would have significant benefit if we were able to, right. to mutually recognize. Si je comprends bien votre point, si if I understand what you're saying, Leadership should not necessarily come from the federal level, level and that the regulatory framework of each province belongs to that province, each province. So the premier of each province then would, uh, uh, would be involved in, say, a Canada-wide meeting, a pan-Canadian meeting, where they would discuss this and uh, represent their uh, province. I mean, absolutely. So there are separate federal regulations, and that's a lot of what we're talking about today, but so much of the burden that also our members face is at the provincial end at the municipal level. So it does require a significant amount of provincial leadership. Um, but the, the benefits of doing so um, um, would be enormous. Uh, Trevor Toome, the economist, has done some really excellent work on what the benefits of mutual recognition would be. Um, uh, and he found that it could increase uh, our economy by 4.4 to 7.9 percent over the long term. That's like 100 to 200 billion dollars a year um, per capita. We're talking uh, 3,000 to 5,000 dollars per person. Uh, it would be a significant economic boost uh, if we were able to eliminate these interprovincial uh, regulatory differences. Great, Mr. Backrock, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to our witnesses. This is a uh, this is an interesting discussion, and I think everyone around the table can think of examples of um, government regulations that seem overly onerous. Uh, and at the same time, we know that one of the goals of regulation is to protect things like health and safety and the environment and all these things that we value as society. There are plenty of examples of businesses advocating for deregulation that have led to really terrible outcomes. And we, we have situations, you know, I've been the transport critic for five years, and, you know, looking at the rail sector and, and uh, what's happened in the rail sector around after Lac Megantic, uh, after the derailments in Saskatchewan, you know, you saw more regulation because, frankly, the trend that we had seen in that sector with huge lobbying from the big rail corporations was deregulation and self-regulation. And the Auditor General clearly found that those systems were not working. Um, and so you see the pendulum kind of swinging back and forth, right? Another example from the air sector with Boeing, right? Canada's system for certifying aircraft, largely, very efficient system, largely rubber stamped the work of the Americans. Um, super efficient, probably saved businesses a lot of money, but it turned out that we were rubber stamping a system that was essentially corrupt and 
cost the lives of hundreds of people. Um, you know, in British Columbia, we had an, uh, an experience with something called the Results-Based Forest Practices Code, which was an, a, you know, an attempt at moving towards outcome-based forest management. So it's like, we're not going to tell you how close to log to the streams or, you know, which trees to cut and which ones not to or how to build roads. It's like, as long as you broadly achieve these objectives that we're going to articulate in the legislation, uh, you're good to go. Well, it turns out there were a bunch of problems with that because people weren't really checking what the outcomes were. Some of the outcomes were really bad, and there was a total lack of transparency for the public. So they couldn't even tell where the logging companies planned to log because they were no longer requ required to publish the maps. Um, in the marine sector, you know, we had a tugboat sink near Prince Rupert and kill two men a couple of years ago. Turned out that tugboat had never been inspected for safety. Um, the life vests or the, the survival suits on board the tugboat had never been maintained. The zippers had never been lubricated. So these young men who are in a winter storm couldn't put the survival suits on. They couldn't do up the zippers. And so when they hit the water, they were dead. Uh, one of them managed to swim to a life raft and get to shore. So I, I guess, uh, but two men lost their lives, right? And now we're pushing for more regulation in the small tugboat. It turns out that small tugboats under 15 tons uh, don't have to be inspected, right? That's an efficient regulation if you're a small tugboat operator, but it sure isn't very efficient if you're a crew member. Uh, one of the crew members, he was a young guy. It was his first voyage um, on that tugboat. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is I think everyone around the table supports this idea of creating more efficient regulations. And there are regulations that are written really well, really smartly, that achieve the objective with the least burden to the, the folks who are trying to comply. And uh, there are regulations that aren't so efficient. And the question is, how do we, how do we hit that sweet spot? But I, I guess I find that the one-to-one -one idea you know, it's a little bit simplistic in my mind because not every regulation is equally complex. And so a government could comply by, uh, you know, cutting a simple regulation and putting in place a new regulation that's 400 pages long that makes, you know. So I, I, don't, I don't know how we get at this, and I'm not an expert in it, but it, it just seems like we need to get away from the idea of simply um, slogans, slogans and catchphrases that are overly simplistic towards a real conversation about how do we create efficient policy that achieves the social objectives, the environmental objectives, and helps business operate and, uh, and you know, it helps our economy function. And that's the conversation that I want to have, and I hope that's the conversation that we can have as part of, uh, as part of this study. Now, my question, I'll, you know, because I think I'm supposed to end, end with a question. Is that right, Mr. Chair? <laughs> How, how, how much, how many more minutes? Why start now? Um, to a minute and a half. Or minute so. and a half. Well, I, I do find um, this question around interprovincial trade barriers is an interesting one because to so many people it seems like a not, not a no brainer. Uh, yet at the same time, we're a, we're a federation and we see all sorts of challenges when it comes to operating as a single country. Uh, you know, not the least of which I don't even need to name because everyone knows exactly what we're talking about. Right? Uh, and so how do we get there? What leadership is required from the federal government, because this is a federal committee, uh, in order to have the provinces have a serious chat about how we eliminate these barriers? Yeah, I, I'll start. I think, for, frankly, I think the federal government and the provincial governments need to be able to, talk and to, to be talking to each other, because I think right now there's that lack of coordination, and we're seeing that between health, like Health Canada, Environment Climate Change Canada, other departments, not talking to their provincial counterparts. And so when we're, regulations are introduced at a provincial level or even at a federal level, sometimes it comes at a surprise. And I think so we as an organization, we're for smart regulation, we're for outcomes-based regulation. But there has to be that regulatory cooperation between provinces because if there isn't, we won't get the goods to market that we need. We won't have that smart regulation that is required. And so it has to be a holistic and a whole of government approach from our perspective. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, on the have, sorry, in about oh. 30 seconds, please. Yeah. On the interprovincial trade side, we've done a huge amount of work, and we work closely with the federal government and all the provincial governments on trying to improve this process. The federal government can play a role of encouraging and bringing together all the provinces and playing a bit of a, 
facilitator role, but they can't fix it. It is the provinces who have to fix it. Having said that, there are rules that the federal government are imposing on the provinces that also creates barriers, and they need to set an example to the provinces and say, okay, we're going to remove some of these or make them easier or make them better so that you guys do the same. And I think that that's how it's going to sort of start to move better. The federal government has actually done not a bad work in this area and the interprovincial trade, I think they're actually really keen on moving forward. It's the provinces that are the ones we really need to focus on. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Mrs. Block, please go ahead. Uh, through you, Chair, I will be directing uh, the first of my questions to Ms. Pullman, and then perhaps I, I will be able to uh, have other witnesses weigh in on some of the issues that we're talking about here today. I did have the opportunity to meet with representatives from the CFIB earlier this spring. I have 360 members in my riding. I represent a large rural riding in Saskatchewan. And, and I did go back and look at the slide deck that they gave me and I note that probably reflective of a poll that was conducted in January 71% um, of your members highlighted that taxes and regulatory costs were the largest cost to small and medium-sized businesses and I think that's something that we really need to pay attention to obviously over the past eight years we've seen a steep increase in the cost of living for Canadians and we've heard from small businesses that they are not immune, uh, that they too have been struggling due to the rising price of everything, which is partially, we know, maybe um, in many ways being driven by the rising carbon tax. I do understand that the government stated that it gives back a portion of the carbon uh, tax funds to small and medium-sized businesses. But as my colleague pointed out, um, I think your organization recently blew the whistle on the federal government stating that they had failed to return uh, what she identified as $2.5 billion of these funds to, to the businesses that you represent. And this includes $300 million to businesses in my province of Saskatchewan. Wow. And that is something that I think um, is... Uh, has been identified not only by your organization, perhaps even by members uh, through their chambers of commerce, but certainly by businesses themselves through um, emails that I have received. And many um, have had to close their doors as a result of not only the pandemic, but then the rising costs um, that are being imposed on them. Can you tell me if you're aware, has the government reached out to your organization or even to members of your organization in regards to um, returning these funds to small and medium-sized businesses? Um, well, obviously, we've been actively engaged on this for quite a while, so we have been uh, in touch with both uh, the elected official side as well as the uh, civil service side to sort of encourage ways to return that money um, and certainly providing suggestions that has how that could be done. Um, I think it's important to reiterate something that you said earlier as well, which is that um, bankruptcies, corporate bankruptcies are up over 130% year over year in Canada. We see more businesses closing than opening. We've had that three months in a row, which is unheard of in Canada. They need this help right now. So anything we can do to get that money back to those businesses, I think will be very helpful and I just want to make sure and this has been our messaging and we have been speaking to government so there have been outreach we have had those conversations um, but we also want to make sure that any of that money that gets returned is not returned to just a distinct group of businesses or even larger businesses that it's kind of given back to <coughs> almost as many businesses as possible because all of them have had to pay um, and so I think it's important that that is a key component of whatever happens we're very hopeful um, but we have to just wait and see. And we're continuing to, of course, use our members and their influence to also encourage governments to return that money in those eight provinces that are affected. Thank you um, very much. The $300 million that is owed to um, Saskatchewan businesses works out to about $7,000 for each small business. What sort of, if you don't mind speculating, what sort of difference uh, would this make to these businesses Particular, particularly when the operating costs are so high, 
um, due to many of, I would say, this government's disastrous policies. Um, have, have businesses come to you and articulated what difference getting this money back would make for them? Uh, I think having a few thousand dollars may not seem like much to a lot of people, but to a very small business, that can really help them get through the next two or three weeks. Um, so it's going to be an important amount. Keep in mind, the SEBA deadline just passed, the Can Emergency Business Account deadline just passed, and we know that about 25% of them had to get a loan in order to repay it, and that another 6 8% couldn't pay it back. So it's, they're also dealing with that. So having a little bit of money to help them pay with a debt that many of them are under is going to be really important. And I'm personally very worried about the fact that so many businesses are making decisions right now to close their business. So any little bit at this point is going to help. So we're really trying to encourage that money to be returned as soon as possible. Thanks very much. Mr. Baines, please, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our guests for joining us today. And, and maybe I'll, I'll continue with uh, um, the uh, Federation of Independent Business. Uh, I had the chance to meet one of your colleagues yesterday and spoke about, you know, openly about uh, many, many um, challenges, barriers, and I know uh, uh, regulatory reform and red tape is, of course, top of mind for us as well. Um, but there was other questions around labor, and uh, interprovincial labor and how, how those things work and, and what are some of the barriers um, uh, around that? Like, I, I, I meet businesses all the time and everyone says we there's still a shortage of skilled labor. I know that we've uh, increased the economic immigration categories and there's been a significant amount of work that's being done there. Um, but then there's um, an impact with the credential recognition where there's been investment made. Um, maybe if you can sort of share how, um, you know, goods getting to service, um, crossing provincial lines, and actual people who have the skills crossing provincial lines, who, who, what are the barriers there? There's lots of barriers uh, when it comes to that, especially when it comes to the more professional levels. Uh, Interprovincially, it can be very challenging for, say, a dental hygienist to move from one province to the next and quickly be able to work. Um, those are some of the challenges that we face within Canada. Um, and of course, the shortage of labor overall continues to be a big factor for many businesses. Um, we've seen the vacancy rates come down um, over the last, I'd say, six months, but they're still higher than they were pre-pandemic. So there's still lots of jobs wanting at the moment. Uh, and so a few of the things that have been done recently, for example, eliminating the cap on the number of hours international students can work, it was actually super helpful. A lot of small businesses were able to now hire people quickly into positions in restaurants and in the service sector, for example, and that's been really, really helpful. The cap, I think, we'll see how that impacts them, but it's more important the fact that they'll be able to work than the ones that are here. Um, so I think that, you know, on the on the immigration side, there has been some uh, good work done. We're a little worried about what the tightening of the temporary foreign worker program is going to look like and what it's going to mean. We understand that that is something that may be coming. Uh, and that will impact certain sectors of the economy that uh, are still looking for that as a ways to find the people they need to fill the jobs they have. Yeah, and again, that that does lead into, again, regulation, uh, the possible exploitation of these workers. We saw some of that with the international students, and that's why that measure was taken, and, and, and we need them to be studying. So um, uh, I wanted to talk, uh, if you could sort of elaborate on on how we can tackle some of the changes or some of the challenges with say the governing bodies who ultimately you know uh, certify and uh, allow for certain people to get the credentials and if you've done any work there it, it's it, it's a big challenge because if you talk to the provincial government side of the equation they will tell you that they have fixed labor mobility that labor mobility is not an issue but when you talk to the individuals who are affected by it because the colleges that exist in each province uh, do have restrictions it's still a big challenge in many areas of the country and I don't know what the answer is there I would think that these uh, these particular colleges would have some provincial oversight of them and that maybe the provinces could do more to encourage them to be a bit more loose in how they sort of dictate who can work and who cannot in those particular professions but that's probably where the biggest challenge rests right now on interprovincial mobility of labor in Canada. Thank you. And I'm just going to shift to Mr. Swanson who have some time there. Um, I wanted to get into the climate events that have happened, especially in uh, my home province of British Columbia. Um, we saw um, uh, a major um, impact on imports and exports, of course, with the atmospheric rivers. Nothing we've seen ever before there. It wiped out uh, a section of the uh, Coquihalla Highway, which is a major 
uh, supply corridor to the Okanagan and, and distribution center uh, throughout from there. And of course, the port, a billion dollars per day. And, so, and it's the largest port in Canada. It's a, if you can maybe talk about, you know, what, what needs to be done there with uh, um, uh, the climate events that impact sure. us and how we need to keep moving forward on, on In about 30 that. seconds. Oh, but we could spend three days. Yeah. Uh, I, well, go ahead, Don. No, no, no. Yeah, exactly. It was actually a really good example of regulatory cooperation, what happened during the mudslides in BC. Uh, in order to move goods uh, from the port to the rest of the country, a lot of the freight had to be rerouted through the U.S. Uh, I, Canada, and my colleague who's joining us virtually were actually instrumental in the coordination between CBSA and U.S. CBP or U.S. Customs to allow certain products to move through the U.S. on a temporary bond uh, it, we're getting into the weeds, but the reality is, is if you don't have regulators who have relationships with industry, you're never going to enable these sorts of emergency measures to take place. That's why it is so very important that the government sit down regular, regularly with industry so that there's a, already a, a foundational relationship. Thank you very much. Uh, and if uh, I could just add... No, I'm, I'm afraid we're actually about a minute past our time, sir, but perhaps on the, the next round. Uh, Ms. Sure. Vignola, please, for two and a half. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. In, in the one-for-one uh, -one rule uh, regulation, and I will uh, go here uh, with uh, Ms. P uh, Corinne Ponan, because it does deal with small business more than anything else. We have this one-for-one one rule somewhere, and it's the somewhere that brings me to ask questions. This is, this is not a trick. I just really want to hear your opinion on this. If you add regulation in a sector... But you have to take one away elsewhere. Uh, what happens uh, for the uh, business that is uh, affected by the new regulation? Am I wrong in thinking that you, if you add a new regulation and, and if you take away the other regulation elsewhere, and of course it has to be on a you know logical basis, it has to be beneficial to that very uh, business, that very business uh, that had a regulation added to it. If you understand what I'm trying to tell you, am I correct in my thinking in terms of the one-for-one one rule? You take one away, but you add another. Um, so the idea behind the one-for-one one rule is that at the federal level, what they do is that they have something called the standard cost model. And so for every regulation that is introduced, they try to eliminate one that has a similar cost or burden on businesses. Um, the reason why this is important is that we don't do a very good job in Canada of getting rid of regulations that are no longer necessary, may be redundant, may no longer really work. And it's a way to kind of keep um, the folks that create the regulations looking at the whole pile of them and figuring out which ones are still important, which ones do we keep, which ones are maybe less important that we should get rid of that have sort of a burden. Maybe it's, you know, we can move in a different direction, maybe. So that's the idea. It's, it's not that you have to be strict about it, but it's about getting the people who create the regulations to think differently about regulations, not just creating them and creating them and creating them, but managing them, thinking a little bit more about do we really need a regulation? Can we manage this through some other means? Uh, can this regulation that's been sitting here for 30 years but nobody really ever looks at it anymore, is it really still necessary? That's what we don't do well in Canada. So this is just a means of putting those constraints on the regulators and forcing them to think a little bit more about the overall picture of the regulatory burden on businesses. Because every department, every regulation on its own, you can argue is important. But nobody thinks about the whole burden and the whole of it and what impact that has on what people are going to do. The fact